So how long did you guys work there? Well, I started working here in 1976, and uh, I worked there for about 17 years. Oh, I worked in the grinding room for 20 years. Well, I started there right after high school. What year was that? 68. I started here in 1977. And how many years did you work there all together? 26. I worked there for 30 years, from 1977 till 2007. I worked there 30 years. I was only there for 18 years. Uh -huh. <laughs> I bailed early. <laughs> I worked uh, for two years uh, grinding. Um, said, the heck with this, I'm going in the Marine Corps. Never expected to come back and go to the cutlery, but Three years later, I'm banging on the door over there. I need a job. <laughs> I, I left for a while. Okay. And then I became an electrician. Then I went back. I started in 1977, and in 2007, I was the last man out the door. How many guys worked in the grind room? When I first started, there was maybe 20, 25 people there. Wow. And at the end, I was the only one. I was the last one. There was like 15 of us working on a repair bench at one time. Then I got down to two towards the end. When I first worked there, I think there was over 400 people there, and we went down to what, like less than 30. I turned the lights off. <laughs> One of the last ones out the door, huh? The last ones out the door. 1988, 89, something like that is when I got into management and stayed in management right up until the day they closed. So the cutlery had been there so long, nobody would have believed. I mean, when I started working there, I figured, you know, I'm going to be here until the day they bury me. Yeah, Mr. Brakeman, don't put me off of your train. Lucky, yeah, Mr. Brakeman, don't put me off your train. It was an interesting place to grow up, uh, having a big factory right in the middle of town like that. And I'm going home again. I had to walk by the cutlery every day to go to the elementary school, which was down the road, uh, around the corner past the cutlery. You know, we used to wave to the guys in the, in the grinding room and uh, yell up to them to throw us out a couple of knives, which of course they never did. And I always thought, man oh man, I'm never going to work at that cutlery, no <laughs> way. I'd watch the people coming out of there all dirty, you know, at night when the whistle blew, you know, if we were in town. Like, man, I'll never work there. Well, I needed a job when I was 19, newly married, and uh, I happened to know one of the supervisors that was a neighbor to my parents, and he got me a job. And I, I had taken um, medals one, medals two, stuff like that, in high school. So when I got out that summer, I went down there and asked for a job, and they said, right after the, the second week of July, come on in. And we've got a job for you. It's a setup man. And you gotta set up the machines. In 68, they had one motor that ran all of the wheels up in the buffing department. And they had 30 machines up there. They ran a, a long, it was a, a drive shaft. And then they would run leather belts off of that. They would have them three deep. And then they would go on to wooden pulleys. So the, if the guys wanted to stop the wheels, then you would take a stick and work the, the leather belt off the wooden pulleys. So did they change that over time then? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. OSHA wouldn't go for that. Because <laughs> uh, you, when you're sitting in the middle, you've got two belts going by on either side. Yeah. There's no guards or anything. Yeah. You're just, Belt. The machines were over, over 100 years old, and, wow. and we used to have to you know, do little things here and there and, and, and try to straighten them off so we could run the blades. Yeah. There used to be a lot of times hair pulling because a lot of times it just didn't work for me. <laughs> Every blade that they did. Every blade that every you did. Every blade that they made, I grown. When we used to get the blanks, they would send it over to us to do the initial grind, and that's what I did. You went home smelling like the grinding room every day. 
was one of the hardest jobs in the plant, was what they called in the bowels of the cutlery. Standing uh, on a platform, four machines, turning circles all day long with water running on them. I worked on the, uh, it, it was called a Seatman machine where they ground the springs to a specific strength to open and close the blades. Basically you had to get it within a few thousandths of uh, an inch when you were grinding to make the, the knife work properly. Well, I started out on the factory floor. Uh, I did what we called knockoff pins. After the knife had been assembled and prior to it being finished, the assembly pins and holsters had to be sanded up. An operation we did by hand. Uh, eventually we mechanized it a little bit and put it onto a fixture with hydraulics that lifted it to a wheel so that you, you, know, you didn't have to do the whole thing by hand. I had to produce, in order to make my 100%, I had to produce 1,000 knives a day. Wow. Four bolsters, four yep. pins, yep. 1,000 a day. After 15 years I joined management and when we closed the doors I was plant manager. I worked in the finishing department. I worked on what they call the auto buffers. It was where you could polish uh, multiple knives at once in a rack. We'd have a, a spindle where you would. Uh, you had another rack over here, so I would polish one end, pull it out, put it on the spindle, and then clamp it down, turn it around, and polish the other end. I bumped up onto the auto buff and was doing the auto buff job and was making real good money, real good piece work. I started um, as a reinspector. What we did was we made the knives walk and talk, click open and snap shut. And we had lots of little tools that we would accomplish that with. And it was kind of a nice job and I did that for several years. And then I moved on to a sharpener, to become a sharpener. Most of the time it was a uh, cutler re repairman. That means any anything wrong with a knife would fix it. So if somebody sent it back to the factory, right, you would do the repair work on right. it. Right. More or less, they would come to me and say, "What's wrong with this knife?" You know, you try to fix it. Being a hand buffer, being a material handler, and after that, I worked down in the shipping room working that time. He used to fix the um, switchblade knives. Oh yeah. He used to melt the stuff and fill all the cracks in. Really? Yeah. On the handles? Yeah. I did a little bit of everything. I did um, reinspection. I, I, I was like a floater. Okay. I was, you know, I helped have knives. I did work in the mansion room. I worked where we made all the fixed blades. I think I can remember the name. <laughs> I was a union spokesperson. I was the one that was, you know, it was, it was sad. Towards the end, they eliminated one job. That was mine. So then I had to bump on to handing out the parts. For the assembly line. And uh, so they went to week on, week off over there, and I couldn't live on that. So we had our own security. I bumped onto the security job. I did that job for about six years. And while I was doing the night watchman's job, I uh, started making some custom knives of my own. built a factory in California and we lost all the buck business. So things started slowing down and it's, I, I seem to recall some plane hijackings and them stopping people from carrying knives on planes about that time and uh, so the knife industry kind of did a little bit of a nosedive. And then they brought in some outside uh, people to look at the company and the business and how they could improve it and two different outfits tried that and you know with no success. By that time you know we were pretty much operating uh, in the red for quite a while. What do you what do you think was the major contributor to the to the demise of the factory? I think it was because the old man died and owned it, Mr. Bear, and after that the, uh, the people left uh, the family. I think they wanted to get rid of it.
probably would have been still working there. They didn't close it. He'd probably be still there today. And it was, it was a place, you know, sometimes it was a pain in the butt to get there in the morning, but most of the times it was uh, kind of an easy, just laid back deal where everybody did know, their job. Did their job, that was it. You know? We did a lot of projects that it felt like you did something. I went from being a night watchman to uh, making prototypes, salesman samples. And they were going to the SHOT Show within a month or something, and Phil said, uh, geez, I'd like to take uh, take some of your knives to the SHOT Show. Well, he came back from the SHOT Show and handed <coughs> me a lot of $100 bills, and I said, there's some money in this, you know? <laughs> so anyway, that's how I got into management. Um, I went from being a night watchman to uh, making prototypes, salesman samples, and um, you know, a lot of the guys I knew out in the factory couldn't believe it that uh, you know I had gone from being a night watchman into you know management. And every time something went wrong out there that was my project, I'd have to get right out there and figure out why the handles were cracking, or you know why are they burning the Delra and doing this operation. And the model shop guys like Wally or whoever was creating a new pattern. They would listen to your input. Once they started the, the process in motion, if something wasn't working right, they talked to the people who actually had to deal with the problem to find out why it wasn't working. Right. Uh, my favorite was, was I think, was the Boy Scout and the Girl Scout knife. The Wildlife Series. The Wildlife Series, really? We made one, we made one night for um, Catfish Hunter. Yep. And he came to the place and the president brought us down, we all met him. The Camilla Stag knife. Okay. Yeah. That cleaned up really nice. It had different intricacies of color. So my favorites would be the ones that I could get done quickly and make most money. <laughs> that yes. makes sense. Case work mentality. Yeah. I like the Terminator knife that we made for our uh, movie. Yeah. Uh, that was always kind of interesting when I had one of those parts. Well, they had the scissor knife. It had a, an Italian scissors on it. On one side it worked pretty good, and then they had a, a lead on the other end. There was a lot of things that stuck in your mind because they were a pain to grind. The High Country Hunters, that was one of the knives I, I designed for them. They came to me and they wanted a, a fixed blade knife that uh, could retail for under $30. Uh, but the survival knives for the military mm -hmm. that we put the, the handles on and assembled for them completely. That was always like a, a little bit of a special pride that you put in there knowing that it was going to our service. There was a bunch of things. And then they had what they call the toilet flusher, which is, uh, uh, you know, you press down on the lever and it flips open. Yeah. My father liked those. So I bought him one of those and he loved it, so then I bought him another one. <laughs> so if that one ever broke, because he would be sitting there clicking it all day. And they came to me and wanted me to do the 115th anniversary knife with stag handle. Pearl Damascus knives that we were doing for Remington. And I designed some other stuff. Um, they wanted to lock back for uh, in the Daddy Barlow. Then they wanted to do custom stuff like the Fisk buoys and the Fisk Hunter and the Crowl buoys the uh, talonites that we did with the custom handles. And then to see all those knives still there when we left. It is what it is. You know, everybody there was great to work with. Um, of course, it was more or less like one big family since I had left and I went to work for another major company. I learned when I started there that we were just a number and it was kind of like a shock to me coming from the cutlery because I started there when I was like 19 so that's how I figured all corporations worked. I really had something good and yeah. <laughs> didn't realize it, you know. But Yeah, the term family today in other companies is just, this is the word. It's they don't know the concept of a family. Oh, I met my wife there. Oh. That, was a, that was a good thing. I assume you guys met there at the factory. We did. Yep. So that's one good memory. You, yep. met, your, you met your spouse there. Yep. <laughs> Meeting my wife was a good one. Oh. <laughs> That's a biggie. Yeah. That's a biggie. Yeah. Yeah. I have to start with that one, yeah. right? That was our family. Yeah. Our yeah. family for 17 years. And it was, uh, it was a good time when we worked there. It was, you know, I mean, nobody, there was no serious problems, you know. There was no fighting, really, or anything like that. Oh, oh my gosh. We had a bowling league there. Softball teams, bowling leagues. Yeah. Dart leagues. You know, we had our little golf outings. We had enough people in, in, in the factory that you had 
four different teams. Even the managers, I mean, even the supervisors that we worked with were on the teams. You know, everybody got aligned. It wasn't a management union type adversary thing. Yeah. We would go over to Rob's clubhouse and we would bowl there on Friday nights. Needless to say, it was very late nights. <laughs> <laughs> and Christmas time was the craziest time there. You had a Christmas party at the end yeah, of the year. Everybody party and together. everybody party together. You were, you know, Nello Miori, the old president, he'd come down and be just one of the guys. You could never get out of the ground. I could never get out of the ground. Because it was, at the time, it was piece work. And I had to bust my butt to do it. And, uh, so I really didn't have any time to socialize or go see things. I wasn't very one of the more uh, people persons, but uh, there was a lot of good people there that worked there. So some nights we worked over there till 8, 9 o'clock, and then I was taken on in the Damascus Pearl Projects. I'd leave work, Perry and I, Perry would come out after he had some dinner, we'd work on the Damascus Pearl in my shop till 10 o'clock, 10.30, grab our fishing poles and go down to the lake and cast for walleyes till 1 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> then go back into the cutlery and work all day and do it all over again. We were like zombies. If I ever tried to do that now, I'd be dead in three days. Honest to God. So, but, uh, you know, it was a great experience. And, uh, you know, I hated to see the cutlery go the way it went, you know. But I stayed in it, you know, I'm still uh, still making knives, so I'm still getting cut once in a while, and uh, someday I'll retire, and you know, I know I put in a, a full lifetime in the cutlery industry. I only know what it's like in America. Camillus was always good about surfacing the knives and sending them back to people. Huh? Oh yeah, but I hear Wallace was telling me that they, they're they even sending them back today because they get a bunch of knives down there and it says uh, 55 Main Street. <laughs> and they end up going to Wallace's place, or well, yeah, or they well, get delivered to the fa to they, the old they, factory. They, yeah, they want to know where you know where where to send them. <laughs> People are still sending them back. But yeah, they're not going anywhere. Yeah, there's nobody there to repair them anymore. <laughs> they got to go to 65 Main Street now to yeah, get repaired. Yeah, now they got it. Yeah, yeah. That was a good job. Yeah. That's what we're hoping for. But you for. know, you see, you see the diehards here. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like, no, we're, we're still coming. We came to land from different places, different nations. America's our only willing friend.